so there, Skype is obviously out there. Uh, a lot of people use WebEx. Our universities pay for WebEx. Ustream is also fantastic. I want to focus on Google Hangouts. I use Google Hangouts a lot, uh, and there's a couple reasons why. Number one, it's free, and free is a good price point. Uh, also, Google Hangouts, you can chat with up to 10 people, um, and that is very powerful. Google Hangouts now, it's linked to your YouTube account, so now you can broadcast. Um, and that's something that LRA, we're trying, we're gonna push soon to try to have uh, webcasts. So have like a, a monthly or a quarterly show where we focus on different researchers. Um, but we'll talk about that. Um, the other thing that's nice about Google Hangouts is that it runs on multiple devices. You have FaceTime on your Apple phone and you can FaceTime between iPads and stuff but you have to be in the Apple iOS ecosystem. Google Hangouts, I can, yesterday I was video conferencing, my wife's at home on her iPhone, okay, and we have an iPad. I'm at here on my Android and I'm running a Google Hangout, I'm video conferencing with my son at home, showing him all the boats and stuff out here in the airplanes, okay? So you can have mobile to mobile, you can mobile to a computer, pretty much everything under the sun. Um, which is nice because then we can get the video conferencing out to where everybody is. Um, so when you run a Google Hangout, you have to have a Google account, you have to have a Google Plus page. I link my stuff there. If you have used Gmail or Google Docs or any of that, you have one. Um, so you basically you have to have a Google account to use it and whoever you're talking to has to have a Google account as well. Um, I teach pre-service teachers. I require them at the beginning of the semester we use Google Plus and Google Hangouts. I don't use Blackboard at my university, uh, much to the chagrin of many of my uh, friends in the tech department. Um, I also don't really use the university email system because my, my kids tend to not use that. But when um, we have issues, for example, every year or every year and a half when we have a natural disaster in the Northeast, uh, it allows my kids to get in touch with me because my university email goes mm -hmm. down pretty quickly. Um, so what I want to do is I want to show you a couple examples of what you could do and then show you how to do it, and then we'll have dialogue. Um, this is the DML learning blog. How many people watch this on a regular basis? Yeah, this is a fantastic series. Uh, the Digital Media Learning Hub, they put together um, uh, the, the blog. This is really where I want some of our work to go. They blog all the time. Um, I wrote about this for IRA's Excite blog about two months ago. Um, they blog all the time, but what they'll also do is in Connected Learning, they run a video conference. They run a webinar, and I believe it's every week. And what they'll do is they'll have a host, Harold Rheingold will host it, and then they'll have uh, someone come in and present their work, and then they'll have three or four experts that will come in and just have dialogue about the work. And it'll last about an hour. Greg is invited to this all the time. I want LRA to go this direction. Um, that's one of the things that we're gonna push this year. But this is what it looks like. That's Harold Rheingold in the middle for those of you that don't know. Good morning, everyone. It's Mimi Ito here research director uh, at the Digital Media and Learning Hub so, at I mean, UC Irvine. Google Hangouts. So here's different people on the bottom. Uh, I'm getting a bit presenting. of feedback. I don't know if other people are. And it's the beginning of the, the podcast, that. so. Um, <clears throat> but what's nice is that you can get, you know, Almost instantaneously, you can bring in experts from around the world and broadcast out there online for free. We need to do this at LRA. We need to get our message and our research out there. This is one vehicle. Yeah, we're talking like this is just hell. Why aren't our planners? Why aren't they extreme? I mean, this isn't not a hard concept. So that was that's connected learning. I also use Google Hangouts for uh, virtual office hours for support for teachers made my pre-service program. Um, you know, yes, I'll be there, but if I'm signed into, uh, I give kids my Google Plus account because if I'm signed into Google Plus, they can see me and text message me. Okay, so for example, 
this is me on Google+. Plus. It's basically a social network. What's nice is over here on the right in this chat piece, it'll show me who's online. Okay, so I can see Bartels right now is signed in on his phone so I can send him a text message. I can video conference with him. So what I'll do is I'll use Google Hangouts to video conference with my kids, provide support. The other thing that I did, at least with my, your, your students are probably vastly different than mine. My pre-service teachers don't like to collaborate with each other. They like to do their own work on their own time. And when I force them to collaborate, they, you know, I, we had to drive in and, you know, so-and-so didn't show up. And, and I'm like, it's 2012. I, I know that you're online because I see all the random stuff you put on Twitter. Video conference with each other. So I showed them now how you can, they can sit at home or they can go on their computer or their mobile device and they can video conference for a half hour. Why drive in an hour across Connecticut to go to school to meet for 10 minutes and spitefully talk to each other when just sit down, video conference? Um, so I also use Google Hangouts that way. Um, and then what I have down here is something I recently did. Um, one of my uh, professors at UConn, Carol Carolina Orniero, uh, she taught me qualitative and basically now she's back at Argentina. She's in Argentina working with pre-service teachers. She's friends with me on Facebook and said, I would like to have you come in virtually and talk to my, to my teachers about technology. And so I said, fantastic, not a problem at all. I said, and we're gonna use Google Hangouts and I'll come in virtually. So I put all my materials together. Um, what I also did, and I put it all on my blog post, what I also did was I did a screen recording of me doing my talk just in case. Well, the just in case was a pretty good thing because um, apparently in Argentina, there's some turmoil going on right now. Um, and she frantically emailed me like two hours before we were supposed to talk and said the whole city doesn't have power. So they went through, they watched it, but then we wanted to have a follow-up session. So I used Google Hangouts to go in as a follow-up session to talk with the students. So this is me at home two weeks ago, and it won't let you see it because I gotta change the privacy settings. So this is me at home talking to her. Um, yeah, I can definitely relate. So, how are you, what is his name? This is Jax, and Jax right now, so what I did the way was, I lured him down here was my son is, the uh, iPad. So two and a half years old, he's sitting there playing with the iPad. I specifically did that because the teachers I was like, working okay, with, uh, a lot of the feedback I heard is that our kids can't do this, our kids can't like, do it, our kids can't do it. TV. So I'm like, and then I said, iPad? I'm going to start off the whole video iPad? with my son iPad? sitting here on my lap playing with his iPad for the whole so talk. This is so I'm sitting in my basement in Hamden, Connecticut, video conferencing yeah. with a classroom in Argentina, all for Lego free. Race, um, and basically it was an opportunity for them to chat with me. Here that he likes a lot. So I'll kill that off. Here, show them, show them this game. Um, that's, that's one of the challenges is that, yes, it is limited to 10, but I also, I, I think that there's ways to break it up. For example, um, you know, just have smaller groups of people that would meet, you know, have, have groups of five to ten students, have a discussion director that would facilitate the discussion, um, and then just break it up that way. Um, I think they were thinking about moving to 20 people. I don't know if they've made that jump yet, but I think it, it gets to be a little bit too much. Um, the last example that I want to show you is I've used Google Hangouts for research. Um, last semester, last trimester, um, in the spring, I worked with the children's lit class, and we had students conducting literature circles using Google Hangouts. What we did is we had literature circles face-to-face -face with the students, and then we had literature circles face to, um, using Google Hangouts because my, the two of us, we wanted to see, is there a difference? If we're changing that one variable, is there a difference between the face-to-face -face interaction and using Google Hangouts? Um, there was, there was a, a drastic difference. But this is sort of what we saw. Is it gonna tell me it's private again?
there's a lot of stuff in the beginning of me helping out because strangely my pre yeah. teachers are not digital natives. So we had all the teachers meeting virtually in Google Hangouts in a literature cir circle. So, I mean, basically, they're talking about the text. Google Hangouts, what'll happen, what they'll do is the person that's talking at the time, their video picture will go up top, and then everybody else is down below. They've worked in some of the little pieces so that you can see the volume level. Um, so, we used Google Talks, uh, Google Hangouts for research purposes. It worked relatively well. Um, a lot of the students complained about how the machine operated, how the interface operated. They wish that things worked differently. Um, one of the most, from a research perspective, one of the most interesting, interesting things that I saw, and we're gonna conduct the study again this upcoming year and then present at LRA next year. One of the most interesting pieces is um, this student here is a little bit younger um, and, and this student here is a little bit older. It's his second career. And he came into this with the belief that he was going to hate the video conferencing as opposed to the face-to-face, -face, and he thought he would immediately love it. So I talked to them immediately as they came out. They flip-flopped, okay? He loved it. He hated it. And one of the top reasons why, at least I've been unpacking it, is the way that the tool is set up, there's almost, you have to have almost like a metacognitive pause before you, before you talk. Because... The, the inter and the intrapersonal things that happen when you're talking to somebody face to face, if somebody wants to jump in the conversation, it's not a problem. Here, it's hard to do. So what you notice, they said what they started to notice was you would watch the other person and when you had something you wanted to say, you sort of really thought about it first and really got your idea in your head and then you looked to see like if anybody else was gonna jump in, then you would talk. Um, so it was interesting to me, we're still unpacking data, but We'll see what else we can get from it. So we've been talking about Google Hangouts. There are multiple ways of using it. Um, first, I showed the example of the DML Central blogs that they use Google Hangouts. I talked. I use Google Hangouts for virtual office hours. I use it for extra help for my students. Um, we also showed the video of me talking with the classroom in Argentina as a follow-up to a presentation and then the literature circles. At the bottom of the page, straight from Google themselves, I put in the Google Plus or Higher Ed slides. So all of this is on the digital text and tools site that we can give the, U the URL out for. And once again, the, UR uh, the digital text and tools piece is free. So here's how you run. They have to request membership. You, here's how you get to it. Greg created a, you, once again, you probably saw an email at some, uh, about six months ago, talking about a Google Sites page and digital text and tools, and Peggy came in and was talking about it. There's a lot of great ideas, and at that point, a lot of people didn't understand what we were talking about. Um, the URL for it is that one that we put up there. Greg just created this. It's just a URL redirect. That's tiny.cc slash LRA read. So if you type that into your browser, what you get to is this. So what we've been doing is, um, those of us that have been emailing each other, we said, you know, we really want to have an online space where we can go share resources. You know, we want to be able to have a free online space. It was... Um, the, the website and the way that we can communicate and the listserv is, we'll call it cumbersome. Um, the forums have their advantages and disadvantages. We wanted a place where we could just collaboratively edit a document. So we started the Google Sites. And what's cool is that we have um, syllabi that people are posting, you know, and we have resources 
Um, there's there's bibliographies that are being added all the time. There's online resources. There's videos. There's it, it it's pretty much like a one stop shop for everything you possibly would need. What I like about it is twofold. One, I want to share all. I want to learn what all of you do. I want to share expertise. Two, most of the syllabi that are on there. I'm starting up a program at my university where I'm trying to go totally open source, open content. And I want to be have everything out there online. Well, when we're teaching new and digital literacies, everything is changing. How do I know that I'm doing a good job? Mm -hmm. One way that I know is this is some small way of vetting the information I'm using, okay? And the internet is a self-cleaning oven. If I put stuff up there that's not worth it, there are people here that will blow me up, and that's what I appreciate. So this is all out there. If you want access to this, please email me, um, and it be, it, I'll send you immediately your access. You go in, edit to your heart's delight. Um, so once again, on that page, all of these materials are there for you to use. What I wanted to do is very quickly show you how Google Hangouts works, at least on the Mac. Um, Google Hangouts works on the Mac, it works on the PC, it works on mobile, uh, works on your iPads. Um, it pretty much everything under the sun. So, like I said earlier, I was video conferencing from my phone, my Android phone, to my wife's iPhone earlier, um, and it worked well. So, if you want to have a Google Hangout, uh, you log into Google Plus, and you have featured Hangouts. Um, some of them are a little uh, risque, so it depends on what you're into. There's something for everyone. Um, so, if you log into Google Plus. So here's, here's my profile on Google+. Plus. Google+, Plus is a social network. So a lot of the stuff I share on Twitter or Facebook, I share here as well. So Google+, Plus is here. And I'm logged into Gmail and Google+, Plus all the time. So like I said, I can see, you know, apparently Don's logged in right now. Um, Jackie Mason is probably upstairs. Nate Phillips is there. You know, so anybody I'm friends with, so Jonathan Bartels, I could send him a text message or video conference right now on his cell phone. If he wasn't here. So, so, what I, so what you do is when you're logged in, you go to Hangouts. And there's all sorts of Hangouts that you can watch and see. Um, but what I do is I hit Start a Hangout. Now, when you first do this, you'll have a couple plugins that you need to add. Um, it's okay, I know that we're, we're cautious about some of this stuff, but this will pop up. And there's a beautiful picture of Jonathan, he's so handsome. Um, now I'm gonna call up Jonathan. So here's a couple of the other things that I really love about Google Hangouts. It's locked into your YouTube account. Um, if you don't know what YouTube is, that's another talk for another day. Um, so it's logged in here, I'm gonna ask Jonathan to join. Are you signing in as well? So I'm going to bring up Jonathan, and I'm going to see if Greg is there. Um, you can also bring people in via telephone. So you can call them up, and they can join uh, audio. But basically, I can bring them in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable Hangouts on air. You don't have to do that. The reason why I like to do it sometimes is what will happen is this Hangout will automatically go to, it will stream, to your YouTube channel. So you could be having a conference and you could stream it automatically. When the conference is done, when the webinar is done, it automatically saves it and it puts it on your YouTube channel. So you could start to broadcast your own shows. But then you could go, you could of course keep it private. You can keep it private, which is what I did on mine. I video conference with a classroom in Argentina. I talked with just them. I recorded it automatically, I made it private because they didn't want it all out there, I made it private and now the, the benefit for me is they can go back and listen to some of the answers that I gave when we had our dialogue. So here we go, I'm enabling Hangouts on Air and it says okay this is going to be part of your, it's going to be public, I'm going to give it a name. Oh man, I'm not really attractive. Um, so there's a couple other things here. What's also nice about this is um, you can have a YouTube plugin, so you could have a YouTube video that you all are watching at the same time. 
Um, you can screen share. So um, a lot of us will use iChat or AOL AIM so you can review a document together. Uh, if you don't do that, it's a very powerful tool. Can you have to use it for like a tech support tool? Or? Yeah. Actually, there's other, there's better resources for that that we can talk about. Um, Chrome has a built-in piece where you can log into somebody else's, and that's awesome. Yeah. It works for free. So you can screen share. If you're running a show, you can be the cameraman, a camera person, um, <laughs> and you can go in and you can operate, you can run the show. So you can pick certain people that you want to focus on. Uh, you can watch the pieces together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up, I'm going to hit start broadcast. And it's letting me know that I'm broadcasting right now to YouTube. I'll hit OK. I'm going to bring in Greg again. And I'm going to bring in Jonathan. I don't know, because it just doesn't, it's not playing nice right now. You have to invite them in? Yeah. Or can you just, and you're, suppose you're going to teach class, do you just uh, do you email a URL to them? Do they, you just say, I will be in Google Hangouts. That's one of the pain in the butts to this thing is, in order to run Google Hangouts, in order to run Google Hangouts, you have to have a Google Plus account or a Google account. Whoever you're hanging out with, they have to have one as well. Is that a picture? Are you outside? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear my melodious voice? Um, so you have to, everybody has to have a Google Hangout. Um, the other thing is you need to circle each other, which is basically the Google Plus version of a friending. So you need to circle each other. Um, the first time you get the Google Hangout set up, it, there's a couple of stumbles. Working with my pre-service teachers that are not digital natives at all, um, and we know how I feel about digital natives, um, <laughs> it, it was a challenge. But we got them all up and running. But if it's being broadcast on your YouTube channel, can they just go there and up there? So they wouldn't participate, but they can watch. Yeah. We can hear you. Well, I can right. see you too. Well, that's what video conferencing is all about, let's be honest here. Yeah. I, right. I recommend internet connection versus a 4G connection. Yeah, use your Wi Fi. All right. We're coming back in. Yes. You could create a, a Google circle for that for that class. Yes. They join the circle. Yeah. They'll find you when you log in. You say, meet me in Google Hang Hangouts at 2 p.m. on, on uh, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, so on my YouTube channel, it should have the Hangout coming up. So a, a, a couple different things I want to make sure that we get this correct. You don't have to automatically broadcast to YouTube. You can set it up so that it's just private. Um, you can set up a hangout. You can start a hangout and have people invite themselves. You can also set it up so that you invite people specifically and nobody else is allowed to sign up. Um, we can go through all these settings. The best way to learn how to do this is to try it out. Um, for the YouTube broadcast, you just need to set it up that way. You have to decide why you're doing it. 99% of the times I use Google Hangouts, it's one-to-one. -one. You know, I I have in the past, I've video, I've audio conference using Google Hangouts from my car to his office, talking about stuff for LRA papers. Um, Basically, you need to do his work. So. Exactly. I, you know, I, I, video, I video conference with people at NC State to talk about how the different tools and you know, we use Google Hangouts a lot. So we are, we're it's all the We're going to launch the first LRA webinar series in Google Hangouts. Our first topic will be graphic novels. Um, non-modern graphic novels. Um, we'll have some people from Google Hangouts on the graphic novel side. Stirge will be sharing his recent research around graphic novels. Um, and we're hoping, we're going to start off quarterly, but we're hoping to have a monthly um, LRA sponsor of Google Hangouts. Um, that will pump through the LRA website and our YouTube channel. So, so the first one will be on graphic novels and we'll send out that information for you first. Um, so as a quick review, that URL is just a redirect tiny.cc slash LRA read. That URL redirect brings you to the digital text and tools Google site that we've been pumping out. And we would suggest all of you join just so you can edit and revise. <coughs> on that page. What's up? 
Yeah. Like yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah. I want everybody to edit. I want. Yeah. yeah. So Ted, do you have like your syllabi or, or your stuff from your classes, or like some your work that you're doing with um, the digital storytelling with kids that I love? Yeah. You could make a whole tutorial. Like right now, I put up my crappy tutorial on digital storytelling. So if you have a better one, um, you can put yours up. My, I think I just pretty much stole from you anyways. Um, so. So on that Google Sites page, we have a link with all the tech tutorials that we've been putting together. So all the sessions from last year and the sessions from this week are all here. Um, on there, we talk about different tools. And then I also gave an overview. This is the Digital Media Lab and how they use Google Hangouts. This is uh, how we would like to use the tool for LRA. We wanna start a, we're gonna start quarterly and then most likely move to a monthly video, like a webinar where we invite somebody in, they present their research, we have dialogue about your research. We wanna start that coming up on the, on the LRA YouTube channel. Oh, so, it, so it'll be on the YouTube channel that people watch it after, so they can't participate anymore. Yeah, okay. what we'll do is we have a, last year we started a LRA YouTube channel um, and what we'd like to do is at least start quarterly we want to start to have one of these where we have a, a small group. What's also nice about this though is if you don't join these things, I suggest that you do. With this, they have a large uh, Twitter back channel and there's a group chat involved. <coughs> so what's nice about this is we could have, you know, a host. Back, yeah, we'll, and it could be able to yeah. Like Joan comes in, presents research. We have three or four people that have dialogue and then there's a whole bunch of people behind the scenes talking. And let's be honest, what we want is we want educators and teachers from around the world talking. You know, we want to open up the dialogue. Um, and then once this video conference is done, it goes right to our YouTube channel for LRA. And that's building more content and more notoriety. So that's one way is DML Central uses it. I've used it here. This is me talking with uh, the class in Argentina. And that's all there for you. I have to make it um, a little less private. And then I've used it in research for literature circles. I had my students conducting literature circles face to face, and then we use Google Hangouts. So all of the materials are there, uh, you know, and, and the best part about it, at least for me in Google Hangouts, is it's free. So questions? And can accommodate with those big conferences as many people as possible? You can do up to 10 people with Google Hangouts. Um, once you get beyond, and I've been made aware, the, the kids from San Diego made me aware in the podcast that I say um a lot in my talk, so I'm, I'm out. They're all watching and all listening, and they're be being very critical, which is cool. This will use up to 10 people. They, you still need to pay attention to some of the, the interpersonal dynamics that occur in the discussion. I, a lot of things happen with these four people that shocked me. I wouldn't go beyond four or five or six students in it. Because I don't I think a lot of them will just sit back and not talk. And then do you see possibilities for this in classrooms, uh, elementary schools or middle schools? Yeah. Yeah, I could you know you can video conference experts in. You can one thing I wanted to do was some of our work that we've conducted, I mean it, it, let's say you're presenting here at LRA and you're showing student work. Why not, I've asked, I asked to do this, I asked the tech committee last year if I could video conference some of the kids I worked with into the session. Have them answer some of the questions. So uh, I see a lot of uses for it. Yes, sir. I just want to make a comment that, um, I mean, I'm sure there's grad students all over doing work on this, but the, the discourse rules for how people interact in a, you know, when, when N gets above three, aren't really at all clear. And, uh, you know, it's not that people are discouraged, but we don't have a rule system, yep. really, for knowing how to intervene, how to take conversational turns, how to interrupt. And uh, so that it can make us look more discourteous than we are, I think. I, I think we have, when we're working with people face-to-face, -face, a lot of times we bend the rules of courtesy, depending on, you know, who we are and who we are working with. But also, when we work online, you know, the email research and a lot of the online discussion research said that we take on like a different personality. We have like a hyper personal tone and we try to be a little too polite when we work with each other online. 
And also, I think the, the tool sometimes interferes with the, us trying to have dialogue. Yeah, and in some of the older rules, like we used to have CD radios, we say over, yeah, that kind of thing. I mean, when I've been talking with international groups, we just you know, say over, and then somebody else will come on, and they have to say their name first. Well, just little subtle things. I do have to say that this group here, we worked with 15 different groups. This one group that I worked with, I had a lot of, uh, I had a follow-up session with them to talk about the process. And one thing that they recognized, that's when a lot of them talked about likes and dislikes. They said that if they were to use it as a teaching tool, uh, these are all pre-service teachers, what they would do is come up with some sort of protocol yes. where one of them, if they wanted to talk, they would hold up their hand or something like that to signify, I'm ready to go. Um, but it's be a tech version of that. The Google would add a button that's like, let me say I'm ready to make a comment. So then it'll like yep. come on under me, I'm next. And so if, if the issue is duplexing, I'm assuming yep. that's it, that you can't speak over each yeah. other, Google could solve it. Well, that's the thing is, with Google, I mean, I said the, the product is about almost a year old. The product will only get better, and it's free, and it's you saw Greg and Jonathan calling in from outside the building. It's only going to get better. So. <laughs> We have a separate chat over it, and we kind of say, I got a point. Oh, I'm, you know, and so we yeah. use the chat feature, yeah. and the audience doesn't get to see that. That's right. So we use the chat feature to kind of hand out that work. Yeah. Granted, it, it works because they do it every week. I only get involved maybe once every two months. Every month. But, so the, the discourse, I think, established itself in that community over time. But, um, I mean, anybody who's used, um, what, I forget the Blackboard version that's not. They have the raising hand, they have the questions yes. clapping, yeah. um, they have a lot of built-in features to that. So, I mean, I don't, I don't need that. I just like this because it's free, yeah. and you just, you know, everybody can get it. But, you know, in most things, I think the social practices quickly emerge. Maybe, as Colin saying, they aren't there yet, maybe not having them yet is the social practice. I don't know. And then the, the piece that we had there, you saw I quickly went, that video broadcast that we had, now it's saved to my YouTube channel. So then you can share that. Other questions? I'm sure other people in this room are far wiser than I am to answer that. What I would suggest that I do is there is a certain privileging that occurs. What I, that's one of the reasons why I videotape it and make it available later. Oh, so it provide another opportunity. You share your screen during the video chat with people hanging out. So you could technically, if you're sharing a text, let's say hypothetically, and it's not perfect, but if you were sharing a text and you had your, your screen open in minimize free of Google, Skype group, although you can only get 10 people on the screen, you can 
uh, do the signing. Everyone can see the signing. You can see 10 people on the screen at the same time. Uh, and one person can describe uh, what those words are in another language if you've got a translator right there. It is $9.99 a month, but if you're speaking with an international audience, we did this with a group from Korea in here, um, and someone in the group was signing as well, so it really worked well. If you haven't found it yet, and you want to show something for your classroom feature, if you go to Skype in the classroom, they have a website. So I think it might actually be Skype in the classroom. I'm not sure. I'm working on that. Just go to New York. Okay. But teachers all over the world can register for Skype classrooms. Um, and um, maybe that's that education.skype.com. Um, you can go, you sign up. I I put my name out there just, you know, somebody that can talk. And I can, teachers from all over the world connect with me and say, hey, can you come to my classroom? Um, and show us something. And I'll go in and I've, I've talked all over the place. Just, you know, I'll stop into a third grade classroom and talk about digital school and I'll stop in another classroom and talk about a uh, great evaluation I did one with a, um, with a, uh, a school in Singapore to talk about evaluating websites. And that was just by registering myself on education staff. Um, so there's, you can register entire classes there if it's right there. You also find uh, ePals has a huge directory of um, teachers that would like to get involved in global projects. The other thing, the last thing you can do is if you can see hashtag, you know, hashtag global ed on Twitter, um, you'll find a ton of people looking to get involved in Skype or in the content projects all, all the time. People all the time, like, oh, I'm in, in goal and I'm looking for a classroom to talk to. <coughs> Uh, Other questions? Question. Um, I walked in and you were talking about digital natives. So I recently tried to hang out for the first time with a number of other teachers and nobody spoke. It was super awkward. Yeah. We were all scared to death. So I was wondering if you found that students that are digital natives have an easier time with it or my feeling is what I believe it all comes down. I, I think that the digital natives piece, um, and, and I've said it frequently, you know, I, I, I don't think it's just Prensky, but I think we basically set the field back by talking about digital natives. I think it's hogwash. Um, as, as Greg has frequently said, you know, if, if I was born during the agricultural revolution, that means I have a propensity to running a field hoe, like, like running a backhoe or, you know, farming. Um, I think that um, my advisor frequently says, um, you know, that kids are not dig they're digital doofuses or something like that. I don't agree with that. I think that our kids, and not just our kids, I think we are technologically savvy. We have the toys. We're not informationally savvy. We don't know what to do with it. I think it all comes down to, and this is what we'll be talking about in our session later today that Katina's the discussion on. I think it's in, it comes down to individual teacher dispositions. I, come to, I think it comes down to each one of us and what sort of relationship we have with technology. And the first couple times, it's going to be messy. It, it, the first couple times I tried to do this, yeah, I screwed this thing up so many times. That's why I can go on and try it. You know, it's, it's video conferencing. Yesterday we talked in this session about Twitter. You know, and people go on Twitter and it's that, they're afraid to get out and say that first thing or blogging. They're afraid to have the first blog post because they're like, oh, everybody globally is instantly going to analyze what I have to say. And it's like there's a fire, st fire hose of information. So I think it's you have to start. My, my suggestion would be start to provide those opportunities. If you work with pre-service teachers, we need to start equating digital text and tools with everything else in our toolkit. There is no difference at all. Because pedagogy offline is good pedagogy online. What would you do in your classroom if your kids weren't communicating? Well, you would scaffold the talking process. That's right. You would provide different avenues towards talking about text. It might be sentence starters. It might be, I mean, so you might want to throw off if that's happening. Pick for that first time, have them all. And then you go to them. They have to have three prompts. And, you know, you just go through the group. All right, we're going to do prompt one. Everybody with one minute to respond to that problem early. So you kind of provide, and hopefully over time you can lift those steps, but that's what I would do. Yes, yes sir. Um, just on that theme, 
One lesson I felt I've learned, uh, which is about how uh, I now handle things differently online, uh, uh, asynchronously online, to how I would in a classroom. Very often, if someone says something in a classroom and you and you want to you want to give them some positive reinforcement for what they said by saying anything, you say something, you know, that's good or something like that. Um, I read some years ago now this really brilliant uh, discourse analysis of why a, a, an academic higher education blog didn't work, and it's because the or the, the researchers' uh, 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 conclusions were that it was because the professor praised the first person right. who made an entry. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in economics, undergraduate economics, and um, the the first person who responded uh, made a, a really thoughtful and, and a very deep and rather lengthy comment. And the professor said, this is really brilliant. This is what, you know, I, mean, I want this blog to be doing. And no one else ever posted. Mm -hmm. And so after about two months, the professor made another posting saying, uh, please go ahead and post. Don't worry if you make a fool of yourself. <laughs> and that was the last posting of the academic year. And you can understand why, but you can also, you can sympathize with him, his doing that. But, uh, so I have a, you know, I've got a wiki that uh, the students, I, I ask students to post links to uh, that relate to the, the particular content of this module. Um, and I say to them, I will not praise anyone. Uh, I might talk to you privately and, and, and say well done, but I'll put nothing online. There will be no editorial judgment from me on your posting to the blog. And I think that's, that's helpful for the students. That's, that's when the students are in college students, you can also throw out, if you put their blog post up to using the hashtag comments for kids, there are, there's a, a battalion of teachers that volunteer to comment on my, anywhere from K students all the way up to my pre-service teachers. I just go, oh, my students posted a new blog, can you please go check them out? Hashtag comments for kids. And they all get the most supportive, most helpful comments. Mm -hmm. And when they get an audience that isn't me, oh, they love it. The other thing, I've had that same challenge, and this is an a, a internal debate I've been having. I've run online discussions, and you could probably speak more to this than I can. I've run online s discussions for a while, and now at my university, I'm one of the people that tries to like guide and improve the academic rigor of our online classes, um, or create academic rigor. Um, and so one of the challenges is when I have an online discussion with my pre-service teachers, I have them act as the discussion director that's a part of their grade. They post the initial prompt, they run the discussion, and I stay out. As the instructor of the class, I don't say a word. I'm always reading everything, I see what's happening. I don't say a word in it because I feel like as soon as I go in and I say something, they all agree with what I have to say. And I don't care with what I have, I don't care what I have to say. Um, but some of my colleagues disagree with me 110%. They, their belief is, if you had a classroom discussion, would you open your mouth and say something? Not always. And I say yes. You know, I, I, I am a, a bit of a nuisance, and I, you know, sometimes will just provoke them. But they say, well, why wouldn't you have a discussion in your in your online class? What do you think? But aren't you a different person online than you are in person? I have so many different hats. I've got like four different identities. <laughs> yes. I, I think you covered it though. Okay. Um, but there are so many different dimensions that go into that. Video ads, I have a number of, I teach online uh, exclusively these days, and I have students that are in a program about technology, they know how, they have the skills, they don't want to be on video. Yeah. They would rather do voice only, or, they would, or they'll do video with me, but not with the rest of the class, because they've been at work all day, their hair is a mess, you know, Saturday morning, they haven't, you know, whatever. They don't want to be seen in a public, what to them is a public forum. And that is a dimension that um, <clears throat> doesn't speak to the fact that they can't do it, just that there are other things about working from your office, the living room with your laptop. You know, I was in a uh, video conference with a bunch of other faculty members, and uh, the husband walks in, and he doesn't have any idea. She didn't have any idea. She was actually on video. He did. Rips his shirt off, goes by, kisses, kisses his wife on the lips, the rest of us are watching all this laughing hilariously. But that's the kind of thing that accidentally happens that causes people to say, I don't want to do video. So they've got to develop protocols and the, the precautions that make it uh, socially acceptable in a public forum. 
and then plus all of the things you've already mentioned. Karen's got a question. Yeah. Oh. You're too close. I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'll shut her down. Um, yeah, uh, well, one of the first time I took an online class, and uh, it was funny. Um, the instructor wanted to just have a picture of it. Everybody just sort of put a face to the name, like man, face yeah. to face name for the class. Try asking a bunch of women to take a picture before they knew a picture was going to be taken. It did not go over well at all. It was just, you know, That's right. a little discourse. About it. Well, I think we also. Yeah. We also we talked about this yesterday. Yeah. People, s teachers have certain expectations of how a class will run. Students have an expectation of what a student will do, and we're messing all of that up. And yeah, we need to be aware people, of that. They're going too far with things. I mean, we had a teacher that was fired for lap dancing on YouTube and that kind of thing. Wait, you're not allowed to do that? No. no. <laughs> uh, so the, the thing that it spoiled was uh, when I went to the, the school. <laughs> trustees meeting and they were talking about how you hire teachers in all school divisions because I happened to be uh, dating one of the guys that was the head of that. Uh, I would never have attended otherwise. They were saying, watch this online, watch this online, boy, you know, and, and they were setting rules because I don't think a lot of students even teacher candidates even knew they were being watched online as much as they were. Yeah. I think too, when you're talking about the difference between choosing an asynchronous model versus a synchronous model, like if you're interested in feedback, yeah. the asynchronous model gives you the opportunity for private feedback in a way that a synchronous conversation wouldn't. So like there are things that you could praise the discussion in a synchronous model, everybody's doing great work, keep going, but on an individual level, offering some feedback constructively to individual kids is possible yeah. in that other model. I'd agree. I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest uh, affordances of online or digital or blended learning experiences is the asynchronous learning experience. I don't think we've done enough in terms of a research field because our English language learners, our emergent bilinguals, our students with special needs, they, anybody, they have the opportunity to push pause on the learning. You know, you can send them an email or discussion form or video, they can just stop and think, how do I really feel about that? Yeah. And then respond. So. I'm using video conferencing not one to one, but mainly as part of my writer's workshop, where instead of writing my comments to the teachers, I open up their paper um, and turn on my screen recording, and I put my little face in the background, and I, I review the paper through the video um, for my online classes. And so I, I'll, I'll go through point by point, highlight the sections, talk about it, and then send them the feedback on the writing that way, and the kids have absolutely, absolutely loved it. It was an idea. I wish I knew who to credit because I got the idea last year at LRA if somebody's doing audio. Well, let me tell you the yeah. dark side of that. What? We had a teacher that did that and uh, they hated this particular Oh, lot of, I have had some of that. They put little horns on her and they put it up on Facebook and it was, uh, it's been, it's part of a, a big I'm sure it's, I, problem now. There I've had eighth graders trying to kill I'm me sure, for years. I know when I taught in a cohort organization, they had a private Facebook. I'm sure they were yeah. making fun of me. I don't know. Cool. Any other questions? So once again, that I mean, we've been running this digital text and tool study group. We try to focus on different areas. Uh, tomorrow, our session is on collaborative writing, I believe, and using Google Docs. Um, and then, no, tomorrow's iPads. Tomorrow's the iPad show and tell day, so please come on down. Um, Amy's going to be talking with us, among others. And all of the materials are up on the text and tools site. All of these different sessions are all there so that you can go back and use it as a resource or you can draw horns on us. I look good with horns. That's weird. Yeah. Thank you. You can actually I'm in heels. No, but did you know that you can actually